All right, so um, we'll go ahead and get started here. And if people uh, join us a little later, then uh, that's that's great. Um, welcome everyone. My name is is Kyle Eggers, and uh, you're here for the Sense Making in Ukraine, a Peace Engineering and Participatory Method Showcase. Um, and we're very excited to um, be here with you all for this um, uh, Carter School Peace Week. Um, Peace Week is an amazing time uh, where people in the Carter School are sharing the, the research and practice efforts that they've been doing. Um, and uh, in this particular case, uh, we're gonna be showing off the fruits of our efforts um, from our peace engineering and participatory methods class um, that we've been um, trialing out this semester um, with uh, Dr. Simmons, who's over here. So at all of your tables are students in the class. And so um, they're, we're here to help you um, kind of navigate this new research tool that we're doing called SenseMaker and talk through how it's been applied to the conflict in Ukraine. Um, and then hopefully um, our goal is just to kind of whet your appetite for what this kind of methodology can do. Um, and we hope that you'll be asking us some, some hard questions about uh, the direction of um, what this can, where this can go, how it might be useful for peace building efforts um, and, uh, you know, areas to learn and improve. Um, the other thing uh, to mention before I get started is that it's also um, Mason's 50th anniversary. Um, so this Peace Week is also a celebration of that, um, of that anniversary as well. And if you want to learn about any of the other events, um, that are happening here at the Arlington campus in celebration of that anniversary, uh, you can head on over to the George Mason website at gmu.edu. So uh, just as a brief agenda, it's going to be a hour, I think, is going to go really fast as a lot of these kind of sense-making workshops end up going. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the project and what we've been doing as the Peace Engineering Lab and um, as the a conflict 695 class. Um, then you'll have the experience or <laughs> the experience of sharing your experience with SenseMaker. Um, then we're going to um, do some group sense making in small groups. Um, we have tables here for those that are in person and you'll be looking at a pattern at your table. Um, if you're online, you're going to be joining a, a virtual breakout group that's going to be facilitated by one of our students. Then um, we'll just talk about the kind of patterns that we see, the questions that um, it makes you ask, um, and sort of what's interesting to you about it or what the implications might be. And then um, we'll come back to the large group, kind of share um, what came out of that sense-making process, and then we'll wrap it up. So um, this, this project um, and, and the class was uh, born out of some of the work that we were doing at the Peace Engineering Lab, um, which at this stage has uh, really been part of an effort to see how emerging peace technologies and innovative approaches to participatory um, research practice could help um, support the conditions for peace. And the um, peace engineering definition overall um, was uh, created by the Peace Engineering Consortium in 2018, and they defined it as the application of science and engineering principles to uh, and transdisciplinary systemic level thinking to directly promote and support the conditions for peace and safe and ethical deployment of emerging technologies. And so, um, like some of the other peace labs that have been established at the Carter School, um, the Peace Engineering Lab um, has is actually the only conflict and res conflict resolution and peace school um, that's involved in this overall consortium and effort. Um, and so a lot of the theory and practice that we're providing is, um, you know, ideally going to inform how engineers are, are thinking about issues of peace and conflict and the tools that they have available to them uh, to be more conflict aware and um, conflict sensitive. So um, this class, um, the, the overall purpose of it was to um, expose the, the students to um, a sense-making uh, research cycle with sense-makers. So um, this would be um, gathering stories uh, with the tool that you'll experience here in a moment, 
Um, bringing that back uh, to people and talking about the patterns, which is uh, uh, the second step that we'll be doing tonight. Um, and then in the end, uh, putting together some intervention proposals based on what we're seeing um, emerge from the stories. Um, and the, the approach overall is uh, really trying to do a participatory approach to narrative uh, research. So um, rather than um, just doing a you know, small number of interviews about a particular topic, we're trying to get potentially hundreds or thousands of narratives and each person's experience is gonna paint a larger picture of what's happening in the complex uh, conflict environment. Um, and so it's participatory narrative research at scale. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk a lot more about the applications of that um, as, as, after you try it out. And uh, the sense making in Ukraine uh, process, so we'd actually co-designed a a different framework um, earlier in the semester, and then we pivoted to um, sense making in the Ukraine a couple of weeks ago in response to the emergence of the conflict, um, and co-designed uh, the sense maker framework. And uh, the basic kind of lens that we were trying to establish uh, going into this project was to get three different perspectives: uh, that of uh, Ukrainians, uh, whether they were living kind of in the active conflict zone or um, have uh, people who are re becoming refugees or just the diaspora, um, Russian people, and the same applies. Um, and then also the kind of broad category of outside observers that might be looking in at communities like the Carter School, um, which is where we're going to be focusing a lot of our collection over the next month or so, um, but also people in aid organizations or just kind of, you know, general people that are interested in this because it's all affected us in, in different ways. Um, and uh, we are trying to get uh, with the, the narrative prompts, which we'll see again in a second, of uh, kind of trying to test three different types of experiences and stories with this. Uh, the first is um, kind of bringing in some of this theory of everyday peace um, and opportunities that um, ordinary people could do to provide help for the situation, um, whether that was people who are actually living there or again, outside people. Um, Kind of dialogue starter question. So, would you be able to use this type of technology to gather stories from people on both sides of the conflict and have that be kind of a first step in speaking to each other or um, coming to a mutual understanding of the issues? And then the third one um, was um, to just kind of generally capture what people were noticing about conflict dynamics um, so that it would be more inclusive of. Um, you know, people who weren't in a chaotic conflict environment. Um, and I think uh, when you see the patterns and also um, try sharing an experience, you'll see um, how that has, how this overall um, effect has impacted our story collection. Um, so we've been um, collecting, just so that you have a, a general sense of where we've been collecting, um, students have been uh, uh, working within the Carter School and within uh, George Mason community. So we've been um, advertising this on the Mason's uh, Ukraine resource page. Um, we've been in conversation with international organizations and also aid groups about um, how we might be able to collect with them. And then also we've been working with the uh, Kinevin Center for Applied Complexity um, and uh, Dave Snowden that uh, created SenseMaker Technology um, and are in conversations about how this could be rolled into an effort that they're doing with UNDP and the, the EU Commission. So um, those are all kind of uh, where we've been looking so far. Um, and then we're looking for you know longer term partners or ways that uh, we could continue this project after the semester is over. Um, and so we've kind of been juggling two things of uh, the kind of needs and priorities that we have for the class um, and what we need to complete here in just the next couple of weeks and uh, where this can really be sustained and supported over the long term. So with that, uh, the best way to kind of get into all this is just to dive directly in. So um, now we're going to take about uh, 10 to 15 minutes to have everybody actually share their own experience on the SenseMaker instrument. So if you want to um, uh, 
get out a phone or a computer if you have one, you can go to peaceengineeringlab.com slash peaceweek. And that will be um, the uh, survey will go there. Also, if you want to fill it out on paper, there are paper copies on the table. Um, and we'll just give everybody a little bit of time to do that. And um, in the meantime, I'll uh, pull the dashboard because we'll actually be able to see the stories live as they're coming in or the numbers change. Not, we won't be directly looking at the stories right away. So I'll leave that up another couple minutes and then we'll go to the um, dashboard. So if you're still uh, working on it, go ahead and uh, keep, keep going here. Um, so what I have up on the screen right now is the, uh, is the live data dashboard. So one of the um, cool things about SenseMaker technology is that as people are entering the stories, you can get a live view of um, uh, who's or just what's happening and, uh, and who's sharing the data. So, you know, we can see that we get story collection counts. Um, we can get a sense of um, who is collecting stories and where they're coming from. Uh, get the prompts that people chose, the type of narratives that they're telling about it. Um, basically get a representation of um, all of the aspects of the sense maker data. And so one of the goals with this project is that it, um, once stories are shared, um, it's not just the story going to the research team that then takes all the analysis and the interpretation into their own hands, but it's actually the people that also help uh, share uh, stories um, or organizations that um, help to participate in the story collection um, can have direct access to this data, see the patterns, and then look at the stories that people are sharing for the context of what's going on. So in the next um, activity here, um, we're going to take some time in small groups um, to talk about each of the, um, the triangle patterns. Um, and I think uh, Sam is going to be leading the online group, but then the rest will be um, just talking uh, at, at our tables here. Um, each student, there's one uh, Conflict 695 student at each table that's going to be helping. Um, and I'm going to be floating around. Um, so we'll go back to the slides here. So um, here's some general sense making questions that we'll discuss. Um, and the, the student will help lead the conversation. But I've, um, for the triangle that you're going to be discussing, which patterns uh, did you expect to see? Was there anything surprising in the patterns that you saw? Um, just what additional questions did it raise for you? Um, and um, do you think that the pattern would be useful at all for any kind of decision making in um, the context that, that you know about? Um, or who would find the, the patterns useful? Um, also, I mean, also, you can talk about anything else <laughs> related to it. So if uh, you just want to talk about what your experience was filling it out or why things were structured um, some way or another, that's all on the table, too. This is kind of an open uh, time to explore the data and what we have so far and, and the overall approach. So any, any questions on that? Cool. All right, so we'll take the next 20 minutes or so for the small group discussions. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Great, great conversations, everyone. I, uh, it's always really interesting for uh, I think as a practitioner to go around and just hear what <laughs> what people are saying and how they're approaching it for the first time. Um, so uh, let's just go around the room real quick and uh, just if you want to share an important insight from from one of your conversations, a question that you had. Um, and uh, yeah, let's start there. Oakley, do you want to? Sure. sure. Do you want to share? You want me to share? Sure. Um, I'll share. Um, so uh, we looked at a couple of things. Uh, one, I answered the third question, which as a American seemed like the most appropriate. Um, and uh, I noticed when I got to the second question, 
I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me what the antecedent was. So the question was in the perspective you shared, help came from and then it elicited. And I wasn't sure based on the question phrasing, if that was referring to the free response box and my answer, my proposed answer, or if it was in reference to the triangle question that was immediately before. Would you mind bringing that up? I can just speak to see where it was. I can't remember how it was. Um, but the immediate one before was your ideal outcome for this situation will be achieved by blank. And so when that next triangle came up, I wasn't sure what was being asked. Um, who, like who would achieve that or if it was about my experience. So that was interesting because we kind of traced back through the answers um, through the data based on which question people answered and to see if that possibly influenced their response. And one of the things that we noticed was um, the only people who uh, gave a high level of responsibility to national governments were people who had answered that third question. That, that's right, Billy, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. So uh, the people who had answered the more um, personally oriented questions, which was a smaller sample size, I think it was five and six respectively, um, did not uh, assign much responsibility to help from national governments. <laughs> in their perception so it was just interesting to cross through all the data and see what the trends were yeah thanks for sharing and that's a great case of why the language in these has to be very very <laughs> precise these are uh they're good things to test <laughs> sure jump in if i forget anything we um focus majority of our conversation around um the justice question and how much perceptions or location to a conflict can influence uh, what justice means to you at a specific point in time. Um, specifically, how if someone's closer to the conflict, they might have a little more of a polarized or stronger opinion. Um, and someone who's physically a little more removed might see commonalities in between. So within the justice question, we were seeing a lot of people in the middle and then some outliers. And Kind of thinking where that might be coming through as we played around with the data. Uh, Sam, do you want to share sure. something online? Um, so yeah. when we were looking at the uh, the data, and I was asking the uh, patterns and what uh, they expect to see, um, like uh, there were some really interesting insights. Like for example, uh, you know. I shared with my own bias that like I expected maybe a, a common view might be an expectation that the military force might achieve might achieve a situation, even though it's not what I think would it would be the ideal. That's what I thought people would expect or what I expected to see. And um uh one of the uh folks had shared that uh one element is that it could be possible that someone feels uh unsure or unsafe about sharing their real opinion about it. Um Another uh, really important element that um, we talked about was that there is this kind of like common expectation that like diplomacy and an idea and kind of resolutions can be found through compromise um, and through kind of national governments, but like it that seems to be so lackluster so often. And so when we were kind of talking about like additional questions, we were thinking about like what, how could local actors um, help create a better peace compared to what we're seeing right now, which doesn't seem to be leading to anything constructive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, anybody online want to add anything else to that? If so, uh, just put it in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, I did your table. Yeah, we were just going over how the overall framework works, how you know, the triad and that gives us like room to create like our own interpretations of um, situations and take a more nuanced idea of, you know, because it's not always like black and white, how we do things with an impact And also, like the end, we did talk about the demographic situation and how you notice that like, there is like a separation of age and kind of the country that individuals that consider as home. Uh, all of that and how that definitely, or even like for some people who are in the military, like it really does impact or somewhat impact the response. It's not completely, but it does. It was similar to what um, 
what was already mentioned before about how the closer you are to where the conferences are taking place, it does it does make the answer a lot more emotional, um, definitely a lot more simple. And then the more far back you are, you're I don't know, you you are um, you see kind of like all sides of it. So that was the interesting observation. There anything else anybody at the table wants to add? Uh, and Gail, your table. And then Luke Dover talked about um, some bias and like making the responses, but people do in the last few years that we have to do. So I think we can put that in the frame. But Emily also went discussion of barriers for connection as if we were going to other things that may not be sympathetic to anything, but that was a part of the past. Yeah, I, um, is there anything else anybody wants to ask or share, discuss as a, as a big group? Last couple minutes we have here. <laughs> I think um, one uh, kind of general thing that I wanted to share that has come up, um, it came up a little bit as a small group that I was helping with, but also um, in general. Uh, was just the challenges that you have uh, trying to deploy this type of methodology within a situation that's um, chaotic. Um, so this, uh, one of the things that we've been working with in the class is uh, called the Kinevin framework, um, which is basically a way to think about the type of system that you're working in um, and the conditions of you know, cause and effect or what you're able to know about the context um, and how it's operating. Um, and then decide what to do with it. Um, and so we won't get into this a whole lot now, but um, you know what we've been seeing so far is that um, you know the conflict right now is there's active violence, it's chaotic, people are um, really just trying to do actions right away uh, to stabilize the situation or to get to safety. Um, and the sense maker tool is really um, best suited for, when you're in this um, complex domain where you're able to kind of probe the system and try and get, um, try and uncover those kind of unknown linkages between uh, people and effects and everything. So uh, we've really, uh, in the story collection process, I think that we've um, faced a challenge of getting uh, Ukrainian participation with people on the ground, um, kind of for that reason, that's come up a lot. Yeah as we've been having conversations with partners of, you know, it's just not gonna be appropriate right now to ask people to do anything like this. Um, so I think that, um, you know, as we're continuing to develop the approach, um, it's going to be interesting to see how, how all of that evolves and, um, you know, start to think about how this approach might fit in with um, kind of larger ecology of practice as we're thinking about connecting it with, um, kind of the conflict escalation or de-escalation models <laughs> um, and really like when is this going to be most sensible to deploy and what are the kind of networks that you have to have in place to uh, get something like this off the ground and get it in people's hands in a peaceful way. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on um, whether you feel like you guys have been on it where closer you are to a conflict, the more emotional the response is to the conflict that's um if you feel like it's a similar situation where the closer you are to a conflict, the more chaotic might feel, whereas the further out you might be in a conflict situation, it might still be worthwhile to do it Yeah. Um I think um 
with with all of this, you know, that this is this is all an aid that depends on your perspective and what's happening to you. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you're close, you know, we're talking about the same conflict here, but we're able to sit here in a room and actively reflect and think about what's going on. And so to us, you know, we're we are probably more in this space, but then you know, other people are gonna be here. Some people are going to be thinking about like, you know, operating in processes of just getting aid out <laughs> and, uh, you know, following the kind of rules and best practice for how you do that. So I think that, um, you know, it really does depend. And um, when you're running this type of process, you can use an aid like this to think about how you're doing that engagement and structuring it in a way that's responsive to what people need within the environment that they're operating. That's kind of the core of the sense maker approach is that you're getting better understanding of the context so that you can act. Um, and what that looks like is just gonna be different for everybody. So I think we're a little bit over time here, so we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, so uh, just to give a sense of where all this is going, so um, our semester ends around middle of May. So um, we're going to be continuing the collection with, um, with this tool um, throughout the rest of the semester. And I think our goal is to get um, ideally around 200 stories. We'll see how close we get to that. Um, and we're going to be focusing on uh, collecting within the, the Mason and Carter School community, I think. For a lot of the reasons that I was just talking about, of um, you know the process for partnership building, kind of um, getting the right connections and having there be an appropriate time to get stories from the ground, will probably be you know I, like hopefully uh, sooner rather than later because that would mean that the the active violence would be <laughs> subsiding a little bit. Um, so you know and we're we're all hoping for that, of course. Um, and so at that point, then, um, you know, this, uh, this process might be more useful to talk about what comes next after, after the violence has, has stopped, um, in terms of, uh, getting stories from on the ground. Um, but, um, you know, until then we got to be concerned with what we're able to do within our communities and, um, better understand ourselves. Um, and um, we're going to keep gathering stories. Um, there's also a um, interest form sign up, uh, which I think is on the uh, Ukraine uh, resource page on the GMU website as well. So if you want to be um, updated about what's happening with the project or um, be involved with more events like this, um, you can sign up there or um, email us at um, pel at gmu.edu. Um, and with that, um, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. But thanks so much for attending, um, coming in person or online. Um, it's been a very busy Peace Week, and so we appreciate you carving out some time for us um, and engaging with this project and this kind of experimental work. So really appreciate it. <laughs>